what does Sakir really stand for? And he's done a lot of U-turns. Some people think that these are good because it shows yeah. he's willing to change his mind. But some people think it's not good because it shows a fleetingness. Where do you stand? So it's quite clear that Keir Starmer does fundamentally want to change politics. What Keir Starmer has done, which unfortunately you know, previous Labour leaders have not, is he's not retreated to his base because he expects people who are part of that base to vote Labour anyway. And what he's done is he's targeted those much like yourself, which are not necessarily your demographic, but like yourself, in terms of your vote is not fixed. He's yeah. trying to attract those whose vote is up for grabs. This is The Global Gambit. Welcome back again, everyone. It's part two. Piotr here, and we're back with Phil Morehouse, who's talking about the UK political sphere this time around. If you haven't seen part one, where we dived a little bit more into the creator behind the content, then go and watch that first, learn a little bit about more about who Phil is, why he does what he does, and the channel, and what it means to actually run a political channel. Very interesting conversation. But Phil, I guess my first question really is just, what is going on in the UK? Exactly. Can you can you help me make light of what's going on in the current political sphere? Well, I mean, ultimately, Brexit hangs over everything. The current government, the Conservative government, um, in order to prevent, they always used to argue that Europe is the issue that divides them, and it ended up getting into themselves into a space where they thought, well, if we leave, then and they all said this. Both sides said this. They said we can no longer blame the EU for our problems. It'll all be down to us. Boris Johnson famously said it. A number of leading Brexiteers said the same thing. Then, you know, we'll all be down to us. All the arguments will be over. And they are entering the most unstable period of their 200-year history as a result of Brexit. They have not been able to hold on to a leader for more than a few years since the Brexit referendum. You know, after the Brexit referendum, David Cameron, who had been leader for six years, well, he'd been leader for more than six years, been prime minister for six years and leader for a few years before that. So he'd been a long, long time leader of the party, brought a lot of stability to them. He resigned immediately. He didn't want to deal with the mess. Theresa May lasted just a few years. Uh, Boris Johnson lasted just a few years. Liz Truss lasted a few weeks. <laughs> Rishi Sunak is only going to have realistically lasted a couple of years. Then after the election, it is very likely that whichever leader they back, you know, they may not last the whole parliament. And, and that is because everything they are doing has to be seen in terms of Brexit purity. But Brexit isn't working. Uh, it's not working how they envisage. Some of them didn't really understand the EU. Many of them still don't understand the EU. And so they don't understand how it affected everything. But because they have to insist on this hard Brexit, they keep pursuing policies that make life harder for everyone else, but making life harder for everyone else is loses you votes. So then they have to start trying to it almost becomes, instead of trying to run the country, even within their own politics, in the best way they can, they're trying to run it knowingly in the wrong direction, but as slowly as possible to limit the damage. So they come up with things like, so we leave the single market and customs union. So they came up with various ways to try and deal with that. So we have uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol, which was amended slightly into the Windsor Framework. In order to deal with with having a the, the Good Friday Agreement protected, but at the same time the British market diverging, which has put a trade border inside the UK. Brexiteers complain. The Brexiteers who don't like it complain that oh, this is ridiculous that a country would have trade borders within its own territory, but it's not. Uh, the United States has that. The United States between different states quite often has. You can't, you can't export something from Texas to California without going through trade barriers. But nonetheless, that's, they don't like that. Uh, you've also got, um, I suppose, the, the issue now with um, asylum. Immigration was a huge part of it. They said, well, we need to control immigration. It's all the EU's fault. We have all this immigration. Immigration has massively increased since Brexit. As everyone else said it would, it's inevitable um, that we were going to reduce particularly immigration from outside the eu because we've now made it really difficult for people from the eu to work in the uk they used to be able to just turn up apply for a job turn up 
now they can't. They need a visa. But it's like, well, if you're German and you can get a job in Belgium or Portugal or Italy mm. um, as easily as you can in Germany, and now Britain wants you to go through an immigration process, well, that's hassle. So inevitably what we've done is we've increased the number of workers, because we still need these workers. Again, Brexiteers and some Brexiteers genuinely thought there was this queue of British workers who can't get jobs because of immigrants. And you try and explain, but it's more paperwork to hire a foreign worker anyway. So, you know, no, that's not happening. It hasn't happened. It didn't happen. We've now got shortages because there wasn't a queue of British workers for these jobs. We've got shortages in health and social care. We've got shortages in seasonal farm work, very notably. There's shortages throughout the food supply chain, in fact. Um, and, and, you know, controls as well, import controls. So we've needed to basically increase our import and standards controls by a hundredfold to cope for people. You know, and again, Brexit is some genuinely don't understand. Well, we didn't have these checks at the borders before, so why do we need them now? It's like we didn't have checks at the borders, but the checks did take place. They took place elsewhere. We had a huge single market, and the checks would take place sometimes at source. We had a lot of checks taking place, but now we have none. So what used to happen, for example, if you were receiving food imports from, say, North Africa somewhere – they would get checked at the first single market port they hit. So if they come yep. to a Spanish port, they'd be checked there. Whereas now, if we're importing, say, tomatoes from Morocco, but, I mean, that's not going to be a huge issue, but, say, pork from um, you know North Africa is a more serious issue, and that comes to a Spanish port on its way, they don't check that because it's for the, it's for the British market and that's got nothing to do with them. They only check for their own standards for their own market. So now all of our own, all of the stuff coming to the British, we need to check, but we're not checking it because we don't have the capacity. It's not physically possible to build the capacity. Uh, Michael Gove, who was initially in charge of Brexit delivery after, after we left the EU, but before we left the single market, um, said, and he was right, to say we would need an extra 50,000 officials to check these customs and standards. You can't hire that many. There isn't enough people to train them. There's not enough people to do the jobs. There's not enough room to house them, to build offices for them. So what has happened is they started to build what they said was the infrastructure. They, they, they got private companies and councils to invest in facilities, which when we got around to carrying out the checks, um, would then be used to do this, to make it sound like they knew what they were doing. And now what the government's saying is you might as well close these facilities down because yeah. we're not going to use them. No, um, for sure. And I mean, so everything now. To, so just to jump in on that point, because I think I want to unpack a little bit more of these uh, specific themes. You've, you've done a, a pretty expansive job of laying the land, which is a pretty bleak one, to be fair. But one of the things that I think I, I, I want to understand a little bit more from you is the – uh, political ramifications of it you know you focused a lot on the economics of it but we've seen a uh, dissolution of the unity within the conservative party hmm. and right now we have a very very well i would say enthused nigel farage right. who's even insinuating that you know he could snap up some of the uh, more right members of the party, the the sort of ERG section or European Research Group, for people who aren't familiar with the acronym, mm. uh, Pretty Patel, those sorts of types, Liz Truss, they were at a, I think, convention or something relatively recently uh, with reform. You know, Nigel Farage is key to sort of maybe run under reform, or he's this, I think, pretty wild idea that he could even potentially come in and sort of become the new leader of the Conservative Party at some point. What's your take mm. on those sorts of things? Are they completely ridiculous or, or, the, or the Tory party is in such um, a disarray that they are quite realistic? Unfortunately, nothing's ridiculous these days. Uh, so in terms of Reform UK, we don't really know what their ultimate aim is. Is it to, as they say, to become a serious political party? But then you would ask, why are they not building up the infrastructure of a political party like, for example, memberships? They don't, they have three members because that is, they require two to register as a political party. So they have three. Uh, everyone that, that will sort of, they claim as members, when, for example, Lee Anderson, a Conservative MP, defected to them, they, they claimed they gained a thousand new members 
in yeah. those, the few days following it. They didn't. They don't have members. They have like subscribers. You can pay. You can donate to them and have your name on a list, but you're not a member. You don't have any rights. You can't uh, vote for your candidates. They're, they're all selected centrally. You can't go to meetings and you know appoint local council candidates. You can't. Ha- there's no com- there's no convention where you can go along and vote on any sort of policies or anything like that. So there is none of that party infrastructure. And if they had a long term plan, you would wonder why isn't that? Or do they believe that they can? form a serious long-term political party as a business that is controlled by these three individuals. Neither, none of whom are Nigel Farage, by the way. He's not a member himself. Um, he's just the honorary president. So, uh, But it could be that Reform UK, and what seems most likely to most people, they are existing to permanently change the Conservative Party because the Conservative Party has the history, it has the infrastructure, it has the, the brand awareness and so on. Um, and it has the the donations. So perhaps all Reform UK are trying to do is to fundamentally change the Conservative Party by engineering a situation whereby Conservative candidates who are more in tune with Reform UK's thinking end up becoming the bulk yeah. of the party. And so any others that happen to remain end up being sidelined. And this is made much easier if the Conservatives suffer a really quite crushing defeat. Because if you think about the Conservative MPs who are very closely aligned with Reform UK, they're on both sort of... Many of them are in seats that are almost certain to be lost to Labour or the Liberal Democrats, but mostly Labour in the next election. So they're gone. They will take no future part in the direction of the Conservative Party. But you've also got a chunk of them in very safe conservative seats as well. So because they're going to lose the ones in what we'd call the so-called red wall after the election, that's certainly going to happen. In theory, that diminishes the power of those who are aligned with Reform UK. But if the Conservatives suffer a quite catastrophic defeat and they're only left with, say, 60 or 70 MPs or, or even fewer, then all of a sudden it shifts the other way and those aligned with Reform UK now form a larger proportion of the Conservative Party and can very much decide the future direction. Uh, There are some Conservatives who fear, whether those fears are founders in the matter, that the party could even split. I find that difficult to believe because whilst we have a first-past-the-post system, they do understand that that will just make it much harder because their vote is split right now in a way. I mean, the Conservative Party has been around for almost 200 years. It, it sort of merged from other parties before then as well. So, you know, they, they go back a long way. But um, they've been around for 200 years. And, and this coming election, they're going to face a situation they have never, ever faced before in that their vote is going to be squeezed from both the centre and the far right. I mean, in 2015, it was squeezed on the far right from UKIP. They did very well. They gained about 15% of the vote. But Labour were not providing a strong challenge in the centre. Uh, in 2019, the Brexit party were challenging on the far right, but they also stood candidates down in all seats that the Conservatives had won in the previous election. And again, Labour were not contesting in the centre. So this no. coming election, we're going to have Labour who are now contesting the centre and Reform UK, assuming they don't stand candidates down this time, they are going to be squeezed on the right, on their right wing as well. Um, so what we would call the, the, the extreme right wing from most other people's point of view. And they've never experienced this before. In a first past the post system, we don't exactly know what's going to happen. It could mean they end up with a beating similar to 1997, where they're left with 160, 170 seats, which is a devastating loss, but they could rebuild from that. They could be beaten down to 100 seats, which will create a lot of problems because inevitably there'll be a much certain factions will become more prominent than others. They could even be beaten down to a few dozen seats. They may not even be the official opposition. And we don't really know exactly what's going to happen because we don't really know how much more support Reform UK can get. They, The longer the Conservatives are delaying the election, 
the more time they're given for Reform UK to take more of their voters. And polling has shown that over the last couple of years, they've gone from about 3% in the polls to now about 15%. Yeah, they're, they're tying um, with the Liberal Democrats, I think, uh, in certain constituents. Ahead of the Liberal Democrats. In some places. I mean, the Tory party is about 190 years old. Yeah, since 1834, I think it came out of the remnants of the Tory party, the modern conservatives, right. that is. Yes. We, we've, I think, scrutinised them a fair amount, although I'd like to do that continuously because I think that much of my generational challenges now and for a long time to come are at the behest of them from the past 15 years, wages being outstripped by inflation since 2008, yes. uh, house prices. I mean, you're in the north, I presume, in Yorkshire. I'm in London. And the disparity, the economic geographical disparity in the UK hmm. is getting to the point where even north, south Italy and the divide there is looking less extreme than in the UK. I've lived in the US yeah. for the past five years, and I can tell you that the stark geographical differences there are nothing upon what the UK is experiencing and is going to continue to experience because the US is a big enough economy that it can get away with this sort of imbalance. You know, average wages there are sort of a little yeah. bit higher and there's greater multicultural diversity than in the UK, but we just don't have that economic yes. size and um, magnification to sort of I don't know, somehow manage this 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 disparity, right? The whole northern powerhouse promise from George Osborne and the others yeah. is completely non-existent. Why are we surprised? But I mean, I welcome any comments you have on, on just a few of those um, thoughts that come to mind from me. But I, I do want to hear your perspective on Sir Keir Starmer and the Labour Party under him, because as far as I think a lot of people feel, um, you're a Labour supporter. I'm a depends on yeah. the context and moment kind of supporter. What does Sir Keir really stand for? And he's done a lot of U-turns. Some people think that these are good because it shows yeah. he's willing to change his mind. But some people think it's not good because it shows a fleetingness. Where do you stand? So it's quite clear that Keir Starmer does fundamentally want to change politics. Uh, if you look at it often, again, you know, um, I said in the first part, you know, don't, I don't try to look too much at the past unless you need to see a future direction. If you look at Keir Starmer's past, it is as a lawyer, for example, he in the 80s represented striking miners. Now, he worked for the National Union for Miners, so he was paid for that. Mm. But there were some miners who weren't covered and he provided his services for free for them. He also provided services pro bono, as they call it uh, in the case of lawyers, uh, against He took on McDonald's, so he could took on like the symbol of capitalism in the world, or as it existed at the time, I suppose, uh, brands like Facebook and Google and um, Amazon may have taken over now. But at the time, you know, and, and he won. He's gone around the country with Amnesty International, around the world, sorry, with Amnesty International, persuading countries to drop the death sentence, which, of course, has, has saved many people's lives. This is so he has a, a past of of wanting to change things. He, he rails very much against the protest. Within Labour, you do have different. As with the Conservatives, it's a broad church and, and, and any little thing could cause those different factions to all split up. And there's a significant section within the, the Labour Party that insists on standing uh, on certain issues. Uh, it's often said, you know, the, the reason why the Conservatives are, have been so successful, arguably the most successful political party in history, in global history, is because for them, the, the primary principle is power, is winning power which is why it's so remarkable to someone like me to see them, you know, so bad at it at the moment. Whereas <laughs> it's often said of, of parties on the left, not just Labour parties on the left, you know, the, the, you know, power without principle is not worth having. Sure. So a lot of people say, well, that's fine doing this to win, but we want you to say this. And it's like, well, you say, even if that means losing. Uh, and for some people, the answer is yes, we'd rather lose, um, which sounds mad. Um, than not adopt this particular position, but everyone has uh, those particular positions. What Keir Starmer has done, which unfortunately you know, previous Labour leaders have not, is he's not retreated to his base because he expects people who are part of that base to vote Labour anyway, and we will, because otherwise why would we be in the Labour Party? And what he's done is he's targeted those, much like yourself, 
which are not necessarily your demographic, but like yourself, in terms of your vote is not fixed. He's yeah. trying to attract those whose vote is up for grabs. It's not a given, um, but it's not impossible. And you can see from very, very detailed polling, which very rarely gets a run out in the mainstream media, that Labour, it's not just about their sizable poll lead. They are achieving their greatest swings in their target seats. They're being incredibly efficient with their vote because with a first-past-the-post system, it doesn't matter how many votes you win. It's utterly irrelevant. In each of these 650 individual constituencies, although Labour don't stand in all of them because they don't stand in Northern Ireland, but in just over 600 constituencies, you need to win by one more vote than the person who is going to come second. In, if you can do that in every constituency, whereas what has tended to happen in the past, uh, certainly with the previous Labour leader, I would say the past two Labour leaders at least, is they've focused too much on the base. So you achieve then much larger majorities in places that were always going to vote for you anyway. And then you lose the ones where it's much tighter, whereas Labour is saying, no, we need to win. The way to win power is to win more seats in Parliament. That means we can afford to lose some votes in where we've got large majorities and we need to pick up those votes where at the moment we don't have a majority. So he's clearly very focused. He's clearly very ruthless. He's changed policies because the public have changed. You know, so he hasn't been inconsistent. Uh, he's been inconsistent with some policies, not as many as some people claim, but he's been very consistent with targeting the voters he needs to target and those voters have changed since 2020 the early 2020 when he became labor leader mm. you know, they've gone through covid they've gone through war in europe they've gone through brexit so their own you know the voters attitudes have changed and what keir starmer has done is to adapt to those he's also had to adapt to a changing economic situation indeed and i think one of the biggest themes that actually, when I asked my patrons, um, who I, you know, take questions from to ask guests, one of the things that they mentioned was along that theme, to be honest with you. Um, but I did want to bring back a little bit more of also the Northern Ireland element. You mentioned DUP at the beginning. Mm. And we've seen a remarkable, I think, set of developments in recent months, year or so yeah. with the direction that, you know, the potential unification of the country of the two entities has has really begun to develop and i think the dup with this essential what political paralysis that has been so uh, and we've got the uh, current leader of ireland who's just recently stood down or will be stepping down what's your take on the relationship of brexit to ireland and the potential for the unification and do you think that that could have knock-on effects again for Scotland, Wales, all that sort of, you know, we're going to branch out a little bit more into the, uh, you know, remnants um, of the UK or so, Little England. <laughs> yeah, so it's two sides to that. In terms of, it was, Northern Ireland was probably already on a trajectory towards reunifying with the rest of Ireland anyway as a result of the Good Friday Agreement. It's arguably been hastened because of Brexit. Now, ironically, Brexit hasn't created extra problems for Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland has gotten away with it. In fact, Northern Ireland actually has a benefit of Brexit in that it is now the only place that can export hassle-free to the British market and to the European single market. And both of those markets are very large and they're both very important to Northern Ireland. So the only friction they have ex uh, experienced is imports from Britain to Northern Ireland. And the Windsor framework has eased some of those, but they, yeah. those, that friction still exists. And that, but that is it. So that's getting off mildly, but also because, um, so it's not that they've gained anything directly, but because Britain and to an extent the EU has lost because Britain and the EU cannot trade to each other's markets freely, but Northern Ireland can. So it's almost like it's gone up by default in terms of its, um, you know, economic potential. However, the main unionist party at the moment in Northern Ireland doesn't see it that way. They're not interested in that economic benefit because that could be an argument for maintaining Northern Ireland as separate to the Republic of Ireland because what they could then say is, well, hang on a minute, if we reunify with Ireland, we don't gain any extra benefits for the single market because we can already import 
from and exports to the single market freely. But we would then all of a sudden have a very hard border with the British market, which is also still a very important market for Northern Ireland. So that would create trade problems. But the DUP have an ideological view of this. From their point of view, Northern Ireland is now more harmonized with the rest of Ireland than it is with Britain. So they right. now have a problem with Brexit or the way Brexit has turned out. And because they are making an enemy of the one advantage of Brexit to their argument, arguably, we're going to see unionism remain fairly unstable, particularly if the DUP uh, remained the major unionist party. They're going to remain quite unstable over the issue. And that could indeed hasten the reunification. Now, in terms of your second point, could that have a knock-on effect for other parts of the UK? So it potentially could. There's no real reason why it should in many ways because Northern Ireland isn't wanting, or well, it's half and half anyway, but no part of Northern Ireland is wanting independence. It's a question of is it part of the UK or is it part of a unified Ireland? So whereas the issues with, say, Wales and Scotland, or depending on where you are, even Cornwall, um, that is an issue of do we become a much smaller state rather than do we just leave this state and join this other state? That being said, if Northern Ireland does become part of one United Ireland, again, it leaves the UK. Inevitably, that changes the nature of the UK. It changes the flag apart from anything else um, to the pre-1800 flag. Um, and inevitably, that would trigger off another debate that it may well be uh, that these debates are going to happen anyway. They're already happening. Um, the, the debate is stronger in Scotland than it is in Wales, uh, but there is also one to be had in Wales. So it could do. Um, it could do. But again, the, the nature of Northern Ireland leaving the UK is very different to the nature of, say, Scotland leaving the UK. Because, and that would all, but it would still have some of the same questions. It would have to set up a hard trade border. Well, if it well, because we talk about the idea if Scotland did become independent, they would want to join the EU. So then they would have to set up a hard trade border with England, whatever you know the UK then becomes, because that would be an interesting question, because the UK only formed, because England and Wales were already sort of one entity then anyway. So the UK only came into being when Scotland joined. So if Scotland leaves, is it still the UK or what do we call it? Um, so that's quite messy. In, you know, inevitably, those who want Scotland to leave the UK, if if Northern Ireland left the UK, inevitably that would create uh, extra noise in the debate. Um, but I think the debate is already front and centre anyway. Would it in Wales? Uh, again, the people who want independence for Wales would try and use the, the situation. Um, maybe that would raise the noise more because the noise is not quite so loud in Wales as it is in, in Scotland. Yeah, I think the Economist summarised it best, at least in my uh, initial interpretations uh which was from great britain to little england um albeit potentially still with wales there but i think this i say it slightly differently when it comes to scotland in that the strategical significance of trident and its presence in scotland is so it's it's very difficult to know where to replace or relocate uh, Trident in the UK because where it's physically located, the geographical access to the northern um, part of the Atlantic uh, as an interception to you know any Russian kind of submarine <laughs> entity that were to come through is is so important. It's disproportionately, I think, important to NATO as a broader sort of, uh, at least from a mm. I, you know strategical nuclear perspective. I, um, my, I guess, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. I would say my view on that, I have two views on that. First of all, I would not mm. mind if we gave up trying altogether. That's just my view. But the second view is, <laughs> so during the actual Scottish referendum campaign, much was made of the fact there is physically nowhere to berth these nuclear submarines, Trident submarines, around the rest of Britain. Yeah. Um, you could build something. I mean, there's, there's there's talk, unfortunately, there's not talk in government circles, but there is talk, for example, in terms of where we build new houses, do we create whole new communities? The Netherlands has built artificial bits 
ta- they've basically built on like an extension to their country. They've built artificial land off the coast uh, to build. You can build entire cities on it, and there are places around the UK who could do that. I'm sure we could build a synthetic harbour as well. Um, you know, so we do have the technology to do that. Yes, I can understand how people who would have wanted to make any argument for Scotland to vote to remain within the UK would have just said, well, there's nowhere to put these submarines. Mm. Um, that may be true, uh, but we could, you know, we have the technology. I'm sure we could just build a synthetic harbour. If we can build a city-sized addition to a country, which the Netherlands has and we could, I'm sure we could build a harbour. No, that's not a, I think that's a, a, a fair point. I think where the potential point of contention would be is if Scotland did decide to leave in a set in the ref two scenario, it's just how would that play out in the longer term of build because building a, a a new place to house Trident wouldn't be a quick fix, and whether or not the Scottish population wanted Trident or at least the government to get rid of Trident immediately, that would be a difficult time. Uh, conflict, I think, timescale conflict. Um, but that's well, something I, I think we should I mean, maybe chat um, with about in the future. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say really quickly, I mean, first of all, it's not a case of vote. It's not like a general election. You vote um, and then the government takes over the next day. You know, if, you, if Scotland voted for independence, um, it would take some years to sort everything out anyway. There'd be a period of negotiation and so it would take several years. And as long as the government at the time decided, right, well, we're going to need to deal with this. And if they approached it rather more honestly and uh, effectively than with Brexit and started from day one preparing, then, you know, we would have those several years. And the other thing is, I'm quite sure that the Scottish government would be more than happy to house them for a little while afterwards for uh, for a bit of money. Um, money so does there's talk. All, there's all, there's yeah. always, uh, money will always get you whatever you want, realistically. Yeah. Um, even though, you know, we've seen an age of austerity and all that. But uh, a little bit actually to talk about that then um, is the UK's role in the world or Europe. Global Britain. What's happened to that exactly? Mm. Um, is that still a thing? Uh, because it seems to have dropped off the radar of many of the biggest proponents from the Conservative government when it was first being touted, mm. and now it's non-existent. So um, any ideas, uh, Phil, at all? Um, if you can so, hear this slight, I mean, uh, you know, uh, you know, contrarian tone of my voice, it's because I just find it rather farcical. Um, but in all seriousness, where do you see yes. the UK in Europe as well as the globe right now? So... <laughs> I mean, in terms of any country's um, presence on the world stage, it's a combination of two things. It's a, it's a combination of what you can offer the world as well as what you can convince the world you can offer. Uh, so some countries punch above their weight, for example, because um, you know they can appear to be more useful than they actually are. <laughs> Our use has diminished because we used to be very, very useful as a transatlantic bridge between um, when the United States in particular, but North America and Europe, that has gone now because we now have no political links in Europe. In terms of trade, we were able to attract investment because if you built um, a factory or anything in Britain, you would be able to have access to the whole single market. That has gone now as well. So our use to the world has diminished. Uh, the fact that our military is also now suffering from many years of underfunding means even um, security is our our use as a as a a player in global security, although we don't always play uh, very well. It's also diminished. So inevitably, so our use to the world has diminished, and that has diminished our presence on the on the global stage but also we have also because we've had a government that is that is very introspective the whole nature of brexit is to look in on ourselves do things our our own way ourselves and it's almost like shutting out the world so it, we're not even attempting very much to engage in fact one of the things that that really changed that direction to a little bit already was russia's full scale invasion of ukraine it forced the uk to have to work with the EU. So, you know, relations have improved a little bit there, but we we still have a government that wants to be very standoffish. 
Um, so it's like we're making less efforts to have a presence on the world stage, but we also have less to offer the world. But it doesn't mean we have nothing. We are still a large economy. Our economy, our military, as hollowed out as it has become, is still larger than most in Europe. Um, mm. Our intelligence services are still fairly impressive by world standards. So we do still have things to offer if we were to have a government that also wanted to take its place on the world stage. It's just that we cannot hope to have the um, the cachet that we had a few years ago because we have also, we have lost certain things that were useful to the world and we haven't gained new ones. Okay. And as we wind down, I guess my last question really for you in this episode is what would you say are the main takeaways people should keep in mind? What should they keep a lookout for in the fir- in this year as we head to the election? Very important election. Anything specific for viewers to, to, to focus on? I mean, ultimately... Um, at the moment, the Conservatives, the current government, don't really have a strategy. They are focused on trying to keep themselves together. So mm. there, there is now a question of, um, is the election in autumn or do does the party decide that it should replace the leader as one last desperate effort? Because they keep looking at polls that say you are going to be lucky to win treble figures of seats. And they're starting to hear stories because many of many MPs don't necessarily understand uh, political history in this country, much less in other countries. It may be a surprise to them that the Conservative government in Canada in 1993 lost so badly they ended up with two seats and now the party base doesn't exist anymore. So some of them are starting to cotton on to the idea that they could be facing real devastation and, and the credible existential threat to their party they may think the party's been around for 200 years but parties have fallen before in the uk uh the, the Whig party it used to be between the tories and the Whigs, and then the Whigs disappeared effectively i mean we ended up then sort of having the liberal party and the tories ended up merging and, and then becoming the conserv the modern conservative party uh, and then the liberals in the early 20th century sort of disappeared and were replaced by labor so parties can go parties can disappear and there will be that real fear that if reform uk con- constantly harries their right wing that that's what will happen and there mm. will be other conservative mp's who will also recognize that in trying to counter reform uk by the Conservative Party moving further to the right, they're moving away from the centre, but then that's just giving other parties easier access to the centre. So they're losing votes one way or the other, and they may end up being beaten down into third place or even fourth place in Parliament, at which point they then do face an existential threat. So that is what they're entirely focused on this year. They are entirely focused on trying to win as many seats as possible, and they don't really know how to do that. They've never faced this situation before as a party where they have their votes squeezed on both sides and they are not exactly led by the best and brightest. And that, so that is it. And they're going to become increasingly desperate. We're going to have increasingly bad-natured political discourse. Uh, it's going to be quite an unpleasant thing to observe, as I do every day. <laughs> and that's, I think that's all we can actually expect. We can just expect... Uh, more bad news coming their way because they don't they simply don't seem to understand that the polling is suggesting that you know yes things are really bad yes it sounds mad to call a general election for this spring because they're going to lose heavily but if they hold it in autumn they could lose even more heavily yeah well there you go guys potential implosion if not it has already a complete explosion of the uh of the conservative party um but yeah, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you on, uh, Phil. Thank you so much for your time. I think we did a pretty good no job problem. of covering a lot of bases there. And uh, if people enjoyed the conversation, you know, be sure to check out Phil's content. He uploads very frequently and very broadly, I think. Uh, very, uh, I think, uh, candidly also in the way you, you cover these things, which is why it was so great to, to have you on and hear from you willing to come on. And I will uh, look forward to seeing you all in the next episode. Keep a look out on the channel if you haven't already considered subscribing. But with that, everyone, take care.